Where is your apartment community on the technology spectrum for voice, video, and data services for your residents? Where should it be? How do you get there? Today is certainly an exciting time for multifamily property owners to tap into the telecommunications and technology revolution. But to take full advantage of this revolution and provide your residents with the best array of services, you need to understand how to select and negotiate the cable, telephone, and internet service options for your residents, and oftentimes daunting tasks for even the most experienced of us. The objective of this exclusive production funded by the National Apartment Association Education Foundation is to provide a clearer view of the options and opportunities provided by digital, video, telephone, and high-speed internet service. This production brings together experts from across the country who deal with these issues every day for their apartment communities. So grab hold of your notebook. Don't feel overwhelmed by the need to master this information as you have the opportunity to simply rewind the tape and begin again as advice is provided on avoiding the pitfalls while tapping into the promises of this new digital and broadband era in multifamily housing. During the past 36 months, the multifamily housing industry has witnessed a greater revolution of change in cable television, telephone, and internet services than the past 20 years combined. The dizzying pace of this change, which is still occurring, is leaving property owners on either the cutting edge, the bleeding edge, or no edge at all. In this video, you will learn how to carefully weigh these options, the options between service providers and their services, as well as how to adequately protect the ultimate asset, your rent revenue. Experts will show you how to turn the common utilities of telephone, cable television, and internet access into amenities, into marketable assets that can give your property a competitive edge. As professionals dealing with these issues every day, not paid actors, each of us will be teaching you the new language of this new time. We will teach you how to determine your options for acquiring new services and service providers. But most importantly, our goal is to remove the barriers that are keeping you from understanding the issues that are critical to making quality decisions while identifying and selecting service providers. One of the initial barriers to overcome when trying to master the ABCs of cable, telephone, and internet technology is the industry's lingo. And until you grasp this new language, you'll be left out of what can be a winning game. The following information will help guide you as you seek to both understand and take advantage of many new opportunities. The cable television industry can be very confusing and difficult to understand. The industry is currently experiencing changes in technology, new services, and a consolidation of industry providers. And in addition to that, the industry, like many other industries, has an alphabet soup of acronyms associated not only with the providers but the services that are offered. So in my opinion, the key to understanding the industry is to understand the lingo, not be frightened by that, and understand who can provide services to your property, what services they are providing, and how those services can be deployed on your property. The industry can be broken down into two basic classifications, franchise service providers, and private cable operators. There are acronyms associated with both of those groups. Franchise cable operators are sometimes referred to as MSOs or multiple system operators. Examples of that group would be AT&T, Time Warner, Cox, Charter, Adelphia to name a few. Private cable operators or PCOs are also known sometimes as DBS, which is Digital Broadcast Satellite Providers, SOs or service operators, SMAT TV or satellite master antenna television operators, and wireless providers. Examples of that group would include RCN, Southwestern Bell Video Services, Castle Cable, US Online, MediaWorks, and Optel. And just so you don't think the apartment industry is left out of the fun, apartment communities are referred to in this industry as MDUs or multiple dwelling units and MTUs, multiple tenant units. Another term often used is convergence. Uh, this is based on the premise that technology now is allowing the convergence of voice, video, and data, cable, phone, and internet, into a single wire provided to an individual apartment unit. The technology exists for this to happen, and owners can install this technology on their properties. 
However, it is prudent to have those services delivered by different service providers. While the technology allows the convergence of the services, the owner does not have to allow a single provider to provide them, which is usually the best case. The services that are offered by both the franchise cable operators and the private cable operators are not dramatically different, but it's important to understand what services are available from those providers. Both providers typically will present an analog video lineup, which is what is commonly referred to as basic or expanded basic cable television. And in addition to that, you would have premium channels, HBO or Showtime, that's available over an analog channel lineup, and it's typically a 40 to 60 channel lineup. The next level of service that's available by both sets of providers is digital broadcast lineup. And this is what en enables the companies to deliver an additional 200 channels to the properties. Now, many of the franchise providers are providing that today, but it is entirely dependent upon the franchise provider's plant and if they have upgraded the plant in your city. Many of the private cable operators are also able to deliver a digital tier to the property. Typically, they will do this in conjunction with a DBS or a satellite that is placed on your property to bring that digital tier. The method of deployment of these services on your properties can vary between franchise cable operators and private cable operators. Typically, a franchise service provider will deliver signal to your property over their underground plant, which is, goes across city streets and is delivered typically to your property in one location. From that location, it's distributed to each of the buildings. There will be electronics placed on the outside of the buildings and from the electronics on the outside of the buildings, the signal will be delivered to the units, the individual units. Private cable operators have a number of different ways to deliver signal to the property. They can use SMAT TV dishes, which in the olden days, we are used to seeing big dish farms located at the back of the properties with a head in next to it. We can use DBS or the smaller three meter dishes that are located either on the top of buildings or on each of the buildings. They can use DBS satellite dishes in conjunction with a master antenna, or they can deliver signal to the property wirelessly. And when the signal is delivered wirelessly, it can be delivered either wirelessly to the property, wirelessly to the buildings, or wirelessly to the units themselves. A franchise cable operator, by terms of its franchise agreement, must carry channels of local interest. As an example, you may be required to show city council meetings or topics of local interest. A private cable operator, on the other hand, has no restrictions and therefore by using those channels that are reserved for local interest in a franchise operation, you can sometimes tailor the channel lineup to the specific demographics of your property. Adding to this tempest in the telecommunications teapot are providers for each of these services, cable, phone, and internet, who are regulated by neither the FCC nor local government authorities. These service providers specialize almost exclusively in the multifamily industry, previously called satellite or private cable operators, but now referred to as private broadband operators. These companies are part of the telecommunications industry. When we hire a private cable operator, we assume increased risk than if we hire the local franchise cable operator. Private cable operators are free of all government regulation. This means that if the private cable operator that we hire does not satisfy our residents, we as property owners cannot call upon the Federal Communications Commission or the local franchising agency for assistance. Ultimately, it is our contract with the private cable operator that is our best protection. Does that mean you should never do a deal with a private cable operator? Absolutely not. A good private cable operator can provide a superior product and service to the local franchise cable operator. And this product can be tailored to the demographics of that particular apartment community. However, this benefit comes with increased risk and that risk needs to be compensated for with a good contract with the private cable operators. 
As property owners, we are hiring private cable operators to offer a competitive range of video products and perhaps high-speed internet access services to our residents at competitive rates. Therefore, our contract should first and foremost define the products, the services, and the rates that they will be offered to our residents during the term of the contract. Defining the products and services offered by the private cable operator is not enough. If the products and services offered by the private cable operator do not successfully compete with the local franchise cable operator, we as property owners will lose residents. Therefore, the contract must specify that the private cable operator will successfully compete with all other providers of video products and services. In your contract with the private cable operator, the private cable operator must guarantee high levels of customer service. Remember that I said earlier that private cable operators are free from government oversight and regulation. Therefore, in our contract, we require that private cable operators meet the same standards imposed on franchise cable operators by the Federal Communications Commission and the local franchising agency. These standards that we require the private cable operator to meet are called service level agreements. These service level agreements need to be backed up by a strong default clause, allowing us as property owners to default a private cable operator who fails to meet these high standards that we set for customer service. A good contract between a private cable operator and a property owner should have a buyout clause. A buyout clause allows the property owner to buy out the balance of the contract from the private cable operator and it allows us to terminate our relationship with the private cable operator. Now why would we want a buyout clause? For one reason, is that if we sell the property and the purchaser does not want the contract, it allows us the opportunity to buy out that contract at a rate that's been negotiated with the private cable operator. Now I should tell you that buyout clauses are difficult to negotiate. In part, this is because property owners and private cable operators put different values on the contract. Nevertheless, a property owner should try to negotiate a buyout clause with the private cable operator. All contracts typically have an assignment clause. An assignment clause allows either party to assign the contract to another entity. From the private cable operator's perspective, it gives them assurances that the contract will go its full term, allowing them to recoup their investment in the contract itself. However, a well-written assignment clause requires the property owner's permission before a private cable operator can assign that contract. This is because a private cable operator who's in financial distress may be looking to sell that contract to anybody who's willing to buy it. The property owner wants assurances that whomever follows the private cable operator will satisfy their residents. Contracts are a very serious matter. They are legal, binding documents. So whether you're considering changing your service provider or not, the importance of fully determining and understanding the terms of your existing contract with a service provider is imperative, especially if you are new to a property or you were not a part of the original negotiation. The following information guides you through initial steps and defines some of the complicated issues you'll need to address in your contracts. It's not unusual for an apartment community not to have a copy of their contract on file. But what you need to do is call the apartment community, speak with the community manager, and find out from them who they believe their cable service provider is. Try to get the local name, address, and telephone number, and also the name of any parent company or national affiliation that the cable service operator may have, since so many cable companies have changed hands through sales and mergers in recent years. Assuming that there's no contract on site, uh, call the local cable company that the community manager has given you. Speak with someone who is specifically aware of that community's service address and ask them for a copy of your contract. Even though you've requested a copy of the cable contract verbally, it's very important to follow up that request in writing. 
send a letter and specifically request a copy of the service agreement or the right of entry agreement that exists between the cable service operator and your specific community. In the letter, ask for a specific response within a certain amount of time, usually two weeks to 30 days. Send the letter certified. Keep the receipt for your files. If there is no response to your letter after 30 days, you may consider seeking legal advice to determine your options for entering into an agreement with other service providers. Assuming that you've gotten a copy of the contract, there are a couple of critical things that you need to look for. First, verify that the copy that they've sent you is in fact for the community that you're looking for. Either verify the service address and or the legal description to make sure you're both talking about the same place. Make sure that the copy of the contract that's been sent to you has actually been legitimately signed and executed by both a member of the cable company and a representative of the owner. Now that you've got the contract, there are a couple of key things that you need to look for. One, is this a contract that is, allows exclusive access to the cable provider? Or is it non-exclusive? What exclusive access does is it effectively prevents you from bringing another cable operator onto the property at the same time. Secondly, you want to determine if the community is obligated to provide exclusive marketing. Does the leasing staff have to promote the services of this specific cable operator? That also has an impact on whether or not an alternative provider may be willing to come onto the property. Also, check and see if there are any services in the contract that have been specifically excluded that this provider is absolutely not allowed to offer to your community. Another key thing that you need to understand is exactly what services does the contract authorize the cable provider to provide. Does the contract spell out cable television services, or is it in broader language such as telecommunication services or broadband services? The specific wording of the contract as it relates to the provision of services can have an enormous impact on your ability to bring on another provider and what services that other provider may offer. Pay careful attention to the renewal and the termination dates of the contract. Many contracts have automatic renewal clauses and require very specific steps in order not to renew. You would hate to have a contract automatically renew for another five years because you weren't paying attention. If you find yourself with a cable contract that is a perpetual contract or that is tied to the life of the franchise, you have a couple of options. Frequently, perpetual contracts are not exclusive, which means that you may be able to bring on an alternative provider to compete directly with the current provider. Once you've decided that a change to a new cable provider is the right thing for your community, it's very important to communicate very clearly and very frequently with your residents as far as what the actual process will be. You do not want a disruptive cutover from the old provider to the new provider. You want that process to be smooth, and you want your residents to understand exactly what sort of inconvenience, if any, they'll experience. Negotiating a new contract with either your existing provider or a new provider offers new opportunities. Opportunities for ancillary income, improved services, and better protection from bad services. When negotiating uh, cable contracts, one of the things that you have to address early on is the length of contract and what is the term going to be. Um, often asked is how long should a contract for a cable uh, agreement be. And what we typically look for uh, is anywhere from five to 10 years. If you're putting an investment in the infrastructure as a property owner, then it would be reasonable to think that you would have a lesser term, such as five years, seven years. If the cable provider is going to be making the investment in the cable plant, then they're gonna be looking to recoup their investment. So you'll be uh, seeing contract terms that tend to be a little further down the road in 10 to 12 years. One of the things you want to avoid when putting together the terms of a contract is perpetual language. Any language that would have the contract run with the term of a franchise. So what you need to do is just make sure you avoid that kind of language, which in, a, in effect makes it a perpetual agreement. You also want to avoid any language that speaks to an automatic renewal. You want to make sure you have a clear, precise expiration date and so that you have a clear term of when you need to give notice for cancellation. If the circumstances uh, within the contract dictate that there's going to be a revenue sharing 
agreement, then you want to make sure that the compensation is spelled out very clearly within the contract, such as which services will you be compensated for. Um, a good example would be in a cable contract, will premium channels be part of the revenue sharing agreement, will pay-per-view. In some circumstances, it's only basic cable channels that you will be receiving a revenue share. You also want to be very specific when you're defining whether if the revenue is based on net receipts or gross receipts. For instance, in a cable bill, your gross receipts would include taxes and other fees, and oftentimes the cable provider will only be paying you revenue share on the net receipt. So you want to make sure that that is very specific within your contract. You may want to define your ability as an owner to market other services that the provider of your cable services does not offer, such as high-speed internet. And the reason you'd want to outline that in the contract is so that you may be able to receive revenue shares from another service provider. Another area that's really crucial is whether or not you're going to have an easement or a license. They are fundamentally very different. Um, an easement basically grants ownership to the service providers and allows them the right to be on the property. A license, on the other hand, grants them access to this property. And so you will typically find the service providers would prefer easements and uh, the owners would prefer license. I can tell you also from experience that our lenders would prefer uh, us use the license agreements as opposed to easements because it becomes something that gets a little complicated with the sale of a property. Even though it's more advantageous for the owners to have licenses as opposed to easements, what you'll find in most situations is the service providers kind of backing away from the license language. So in those situations, um, and you get to, through the negotiations and there's just no way they're going to grant the license, then what you can do is have a release of easement in your contract as an addendum so that in the situation that where there's a default or circumstances dictate that you need to file the release of easement, then you've had both parties agree to that up front. In all of our agreements with our cable providers as well as any telecommunication provider, we have been adding a marketing agreement within the contract. It's not just within the service level agreement, but it actually is somewhat of an addendum. And the reason for that is up front we always find the vendors offering to provide numerous marketing services, collateral material, and what we have found in the past is you get into the second, third year, um, nobody's around, collateral material is stale and old within the leasing offices. So what we've added is information that speaks to the fact that they will provide collateral material on the property on a monthly or a quarterly basis, um, they'll provide point of sales information, whether or not they're going to have events or host parties to kick off their services or periodically uh, share with the uh, residents of our communities what kind of new services they're providing or enhancements to the services. So this is something we feel is very important. In summary, I mean, one of the things you'll, you'll realize is that when things are going really well, the service providers performing uh, services up to everybody's expectations, nobody really cares about what the contract states. However, in the situation where things are falling apart, you're losing residents as a result, you go back to the contract and you find that if you don't have service level agreements or you don't have default language or cure periods, then you really are stuck in a situation which could be really detrimental to the real estate as well as your ability to compete within the marketplace. Bulk cable is something that many owners will be approached with uh, in negotiating a cable contract. Most owners do not enter into bulk cable agreements, which are agreements where the cable company will sell the cable retail to the owner, and the owner then sells it to the resident, typically built into their rent. But while most owners find this successful during lease-up, most of them are not finding this successful as a long-term tool, but it is dependent upon the owner and the rent demographic. Over the past few years, property owners have been approached by many internet service providers who wish to offer our residents their high-speed internet products. As far as doing a contract with a particular internet service provider, all the same issues apply. You want the same type of protections that we have been talking about regarding private cable operators also to apply to internet service providers. Theoretically, high-speed internet service is available to the multifamily communities from a number of sources. 
Uh, franchise cable operators provide services, typically an at-home or a roadrunner type product. Private cable operators are able to deliver high-speed internet, typically in conjunction with third-party broadband service providers. ILEX, LEX, or RBOX are able, if the distance is correct, to deliver digital subscriber line service to the properties, as are CLEX. And in addition to that, there are a number of ISPs or broadband service providers that can provide high-speed internet service to your property, again, depending upon location. The critical issue to understand when thinking about high-speed internet service providers is the method of delivery. Typically, a cable operator is going to deliver using a cable modem type service, and that's certainly the case with franchise cable operators. Private cable operators have an alternative depending upon the ownership and control of the wiring to deliver a cable modem type service or if they have access to the telephone lines to deliver a DSL type service. The telephone companies, whether they be ILEX or CLEX, will typically deliver a DSL type service and a broadband service provider, again, it depends on what lines they have access to or if there is no access to the existing infrastructure all of these groups have the ability to deliver service via a wireless connection. Issues to consider when you are selecting a high-speed internet service provider for your property is the ownership of the existing plant, who controls the wire, and are you comfortable with that service provider. The second issue is content. Content is really important from your resident's perspective and it is content that is going to drive the residents to use this site. And the last thing to consider is the value of choice. As we've learned in the past by new technologies and new services, the services do not always uh, work as well as they should. And I think there is real value in offering more than one choice of service providers in the high-speed internet arena today. The telephone service industry, like the cable television service industry, has undergone a number of changes in the last few years, and there are a number of acronyms associated with this industry as well. In the olden days, the only telephone companies that were delivering local service to the properties were the regional bell companies, sometimes referred to today as the RBOX, or regional bell operating companies. Another term for this group today is a LEC or an ILEC, which stands for a local exchange carrier or an incumbent local exchange carrier. Examples of these providers would be Bell South, Southwestern Bell, which now includes Ameritech, Pac Bell, and Southern New England Telephone, Verizon, which is the old Bell Atlantic and GTE, and US West. Recently, there has been competition made available for the local services and the companies that deliver this competitive service is called a CLEC or a competitive local exchange carrier. Examples of these companies would be Winstar, Telligent, Covad, just to name a few. The competitive local exchange carriers, as I mentioned, will always be a second provider to your property. Therefore, if you sign an agreement with these companies, it will be an exclusive marketing agreement. It cannot be an exclusive access agreement because of federal law. Services that a competitive local exchange company or carrier would provide would be local services, dial tone, and all of the add-ons that you can buy. They most certainly will be selling long distance services to your properties and in many cases will also be offering high speed internet over a DSL line service. The advantage for your residents of using a competitive local exchange carrier is typically these services will be priced somewhat less than the local exchange carrier. The decision to upgrade a property's cable and telephone wiring system should not be made impulsively. The following is some critical and useful advice on preliminary steps to take before beginning an upgrade. Before you proceed with any cable upgrade, you want to you first find out what your residents want. Maybe they don't care. Maybe there's no need to do the upgrade. So you want to find out the demographics of your, of your residents and you want to find out uh, if they're interested in, say, high-speed internet service. Do they even own computers? 
The way we go about it is we survey our residents and we have a list of questions that we'll ask them and, um, and we use the facts we gather from these surveys to determine whether we should go ahead with an upgrade or service, whether we're deciding between three buildings and which building should we do first. Was there more of a need at building A versus building C? One of the things we did find out though is you'll never get the information unless you offer some sort of incentive to the resident to return the survey to you. Whether it's a contest or a little gift, um, that's a good way to get them to respond. And depending on when your property was built, how old um, your building is, you know, can determine how old your cable plants are. It may be that 10 or 20 years ago a cable upgrade was performed too, so you're going to have um, old cable, new cable, you need to determine that to decide what kind of services you can uh, deliver over that. There are really three ways to evaluate a cap your um, cable infrastructures. First way is you can pay to have somebody do it. It's very expensive. There aren't very many people specialized in it or qualified to do it. The second way is if you already have chosen a service provider, um, if you're looking to do high-speed internet or um, data network in your building, a lot of times that service provider will come on site and do a detailed site survey for you. They'll tell you what your cabling infrastructure is and, and let you know the capacities of it and whether or not it can deliver the service you want to deliver or would it need upgraded. The third way is to do it yourself and it's really not as scary as you think it is. I mean, you know, it's it's like plumbing. I mean, you you had it in your building and you just need to not be afraid of it and go take a look at it and you'll be surprised what you can figure out on your own. What we do is we start with the on-site staff. They're the people that live at the property, they know the property, the maintenance staff knows all the nooks and crannies and corners and closets and they can really, they really already have a good idea of what's in the building. A lot of times we'll just send a disposable camera and ask them to go through, go to that room where the telephone service man goes, go to the room where the cable TV guy goes, take pictures of what he does. We ask them to just remove the wall plate with a screwdriver and pull the wall plate out and take a photograph of that. Then we can see how, how the wiring has been terminated there at the wall plate. Um, take a picture of the front of the wall plate. Is there always one in a living room? Is there always one in a bedroom? Sometimes we may only have telephone one place and cable television outlets another place. Um, we want to get an idea of how many places we can provide service in a unit. The service provider may want to do an overbuild. Um, an overbuild is bringing in all brand new coax. So they have to go into every unit, through every conduit, all through your entire property. And there are a lot of questions that we want to have answered before we approve the overbuild plans. Some of the main points you need to hit is to be able to have owner approval on anything they will be doing to the interior or exterior of your building. Anything that affects the integrity or look of your building. Um, especially if they need to have access to your roof. If they need to go to your roof, you want to make sure that any equipment they put up there, anything they do will not void your rooftop warranty. And also if they're going to put any molding on the building, you'd want to approve that so that it aesthetically fits in with your building. At the same time you're looking for the wiring in your building, you're going to be hearing a lot about wireless. There are a lot of wireless solutions that are getting all of the attention nowadays. I feel like I spend my life um, battling the wireless solution. Wireless has its, it has a solution. It, it you know, works well in between buildings. If you have a garden style that doesn't have a conduit system, you know, wireless from building to building is a good solution. But wireless is, um, it takes a lot to support. Um, it doesn't work more than it does work. At Forest City, we run a help desk, and I can't imagine the support calls that would come in if we were running wireless networks everywhere. I'd say proceed cautiously with the wireless solution. It has, it has its place, but it also is very hard to support, very hard to deliver, and still very costly. As you've now learned, making the decision to upgrade the wiring on a property requires attention to detail and careful planning. But in the end, by whatever means you reach this end, your efforts will be rewarded with both cutting-edge services 
a more competitive property, and best of all, happier residents. Another difficult challenge is for both owners and their attorneys to remain current with the rulings from the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, and state regulatory bodies. The Federal Communications Commission has a ruling regarding inside wiring, which many owners have read a lot about. The biggest thing to remember is that the rules basically stipulate that the cable company at the end of the contract has the power to decide whether they want to remove the inside wiring, sell the inside wiring to you, or abandon it. If they decide to abandon it, they must do so, leaving it operational and intact. However, in new contracts, uh, we typically always recommend that when owners enter into an agreement, that they define inside wiring as everything from inside the apartment unit, from each cable outlet, up to 12 inches outside of each building. And at the end of the contract, it's very important to say that they want ownership of that upon termination of the contract, free and clear. Mandatory access is a state statute, not controlled by the federal government, the FCC has nothing to do with it, that controls the owner's ability on the property to get a new cable operator. Mandatory access basically says that you can neither remove an existing cable operator from a property or prevent them from coming on in new construction. You, by this statute, must allow them to do those things. Now, you do not have to grant them exclusive service to the property you can have another provider. The big thing to remember is that marketing is the key. You control access to the marketing. While you must let them on the property, you do not have to let them market on the property. So if you are having troubles with them in negotiating a fair contract, use the ability to control marketing on the property is the important piece. There are several states that have mandatory access and the best way to identify these is via website multihousing.com. Another important regulatory issue is a ruling that pertains to the installation of a satellite dish. Under a ruling from the FCC, residents currently have the right to install a small satellite dish of one meter or less in diameter entirely within their leased premises. No mounting on the side of the building, extension poles, the roof, or on other common areas. There is to be no drilling of holes through firewalls or on balcony railings. An apartment manager can require an additional damage deposit and liability insurance where necessary. The telecommunications industry can be amazingly confusing and difficult to understand. And in summary, I think I would suggest that it's important to take your time to understand the industry lingo and not be frightened by that. And then most importantly, again, understand who are the service provider alternatives? What services can they deliver? And how will they deliver that to your property? And then understand your resident or demographic base. What is important to those residents? And really t try to tie the services that are being offered to the needs of your specific resident and it may be a very different decision from property to property. The last item to remember is no amount of ancillary income or revenue share that is generated by any contract can pay for the loss of one residence because the customer service or the services that are provided by the operator are poor. It is not about specific technology, something that seems to change with each passing moment. It is about the services provided and the companies providing them. Are you providing the services your residents want or need? And are your service providers capable of meeting these needs both today and tomorrow? At the end of this video, you will see a listing of information sources which go into greater detail about many of the items raised by our speakers. But remember, there are also a number of people affiliated with the National Apartment Association and National Multi-Housing Council whom you can count on as a resource for additional information. To take advantage of the technology revolution and provide the best possible telecommunication services to your residents, you need to study and master the key points that have been raised in this video by those who deal with these issues every day. And soon you too will be able to take full advantage of the latest changes in technology.